Isaac Asimov was one of the first science fiction writers to predict that, and he imagines even more sophisticated robots in the future. Those kinds of predictions appear often in his collection of 335 books. 16 of them were published in the last six months alone. <laughs> it's incredible. Isaac Asimov, a very tired man, is here. <laughs> well, that 335. 335. And how many in the last year? Oh, I don't know. Over yeah. the last year, there's over How 20. How do you do it? By not doing anything else. Well, but come on. I mean, nobody is that prolific and still have that kind of popularity. Oh, I'm not sure about the popularity. I'm no, no Stephen King, you know. Yeah, but he doesn't write 355 books either. <laughs> Give him a time, I guess. Well, but I tell you, the subject of robots is popular. As a matter of fact, the reason I'm in Washington is because the Congressional Clearinghouse wants me to talk to them about robots. The Congressional Clearinghouse on the future. Uh, yes. Right. And what are you going to tell them? Well, I'm not sure yet. I've got till tonight <laughs> to make up my mind. God. Well, tell <laughs> us what you believe. I mean, we, Robots and Empires are, is one more science fiction that, uh, that builds on some other earlier science yes. fiction books you've written. But let me stay with just the, what you're going to tell the Congressional Clearinghouse and, and how you feel about robots and where is it all going. Put your telescope on. Well, the importance of robots is that they're going to do the kind of jobs that human beings oughtn't to do because it underuses the brain. And yet human beings have had to do it because neither animals nor machines are smart enough. Now we've got computerized machines, robots, mm -hmm. that are smart enough to do this work. The only trouble is that it means lots of people are going to find their jobs disappearing. And we're going to have a transition period. Like whom? I mean, we know all about robots on assembly lines. That's reality today forecasted 15 years and, and who's going to lose their job because of an ass Well, robot. it seems to me that a great deal of the office work, uh, the scut work in offices are going Typing to... Typing letters, doing that kind of thing? Yeah, either that or be automated. Yeah. Uh, that uh, serv servants, if any still exist, will be replaced by robots to some extent. Uh, and uh, similarly, any kind of work that is repetitious and dull and doesn't really take much brains uh, probably can be done by robots. Are there nations ahead of us in the process of using robots? Well there's no nation that's ahead of us in the technology yeah. but Japan uses more robots than we do for some reason their social system can absorb the robots faster than we can. Uh, in the future though we're going to have to match yeah. Japan. Are we going to run into real problems with labor unions and and some real social issues about protection of uh, people who've invested most of their lives with companies? Oh yes, oh yes, there's going to be technological unemployment, there's going to be a lot of resentment against robots and uh, I think that we're going to have to take into account the necessity of finding work for many people at retraining them, re-educating them, if, if it can't be done in some cases, then finding work anyway for them. You are an interesting man, and I want to just describe, born in Russia. That's right. Came here, where in Russia? I was born 50 miles south of Smolensk, you know. came, or 230 miles southwest of Moscow. Came to the United States when you were how old? Three years. Yeah. Parents immigrated? Um, Oh, it was uh, several years after the revolution. We came in 1923, and uh, so my native language is English. I remember nothing yeah. about the Soviet Union. And you wanted to be a writer very early. Eleven years old, I started writing. Yeah. First book published, what, about 1950? Well, that was the first book published in 1950 when I was 30 years old, but I had been publishing in the magazine short stories for 11 years before that. My first short story was sold professionally in 1938 so that I'm rapidly approaching my 50th anniversary as a professional writer, which isn't bad considering that I'm only a little over 30. <laughs> <laughs> is it getting easier for you? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's been getting easier all the time simply because uh, I gained in self-assurance. I, I, it's not for decades have I worried about rejections. And then, uh, you know, certain facility. Do you have writer's block? Not so far. Never. Never. 355 books would suggest by definition <laughs> there's no writer's block here. <laughs> However, I tell you, I switch, from, uh, I switch from one thing to another. That is, I sometimes get tired of something I'm writing. Fortunately, yeah. I'm never without several projects in mind so that uh, 
so that if I wake yeah. up in the morning, I'm sick and tired of what I'm doing, I do something else. So you've got about six typewriters there in the house where you can go to one to one to one? Well, I've got several, got but six I, only use one. Going. Yeah. I only use one, but I take out pieces of paper and put in different pieces of paper. You've written biographies. Yes. Uh, you wrote a lot of magazine articles, everything about from about atomic energy and to, to uh, what? Well, I've even written about seven books of limericks. Two, of them, two of them clean. <laughs> and uh, I've written a two-volume book on Shakespeare, a two-volume uh, analysis of the Bible. And uh, I've written, oh, about 12 or 13 history books. I've written mysteries as well as science fiction. I've written books for young people, and I've written a three-volume history of physics. And what do you want people to say about you? Do you want them to say he was prolific, he was prophetic, or do you care about them saying, here is a great writer, here's a craftsman of the language? Oh, I doubt that anyone will ever say I'm a great writer. Mm -hmm. I hope they say, here's one fellow who got a lot of pleasure out of writing, because most of the writers I know or have heard of have suffered extremely. Yeah, it's painful. And uh, I don't. Uh, I enjoy it. It's it a comes like a stream with you. Oh, you just sit down and you... I saw what once said, what do you need to start writing? And I said, a typewriter within reach. <laughs> what time do you start writing? Get up in the morning and, and go right to it? I'm an early morning person. I usually get to work by 7.30. Yeah. Do you go to an office to do it? No, right in my, right in my apartment. Right there. So you get up, take a shower, and... Then get then to work. Get to work. And do you write for the entire day? Well, I used to write till around 10 p.m. I noticed lately old age is catching up with me. 10 p.m.? <laughs> old age is catching up with me. I tend to stop at 9 p.m. However, I'm frequently interrupted. I mustn't make it appear that I work 7.30 a.m. Yeah. You mean phone calls and Phone calls and, and the mail and I have to eat and my wife insists I talk to her once in a while, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you still slip off into little Gilbert and Sullivan now and then? Oh, yes. I belong to the Gilbert and Sullivan Society. And uh, I attend Gilbert and Sullivan plays every chance I have. And in fact, what I would like to do yeah. is to write a book on Gilbert and Sullivan. I, I'm trying to find time for it. Well, why don't you take time? Because you, it's such an important part of your life. It's one of your few. I think I will. I think I will. It's just that you'd think with 335 books that publishers would say, let's try somebody else. But yeah. they don't. Someone said to, um, I guess it was Sir Lawrence Olivier, why do you act? And he said, because if I don't, I'd go crazy. Is it the same way with writing? Well, it's been suggested that since I can probably make enough by working half the year, why don't yeah. I relax the exactly. other half? And I said, well, I would, but just to pass the time away, do you mind if I write? <laughs> <laughs> Isaac Asimov, he is prolific, he is popular, he is an interesting man, and we'll talk more when we come back. Stay with us. <laughs> Asimov is here. This, uh, robots and Empires is science fiction about robots. Uh, Halley's Comet, you've written about that. You've got a new book about that, too. Yes, it's called Asimov's Guide to Halley's Comet. Uh, it's a different publisher. Uh, Nonfiction, but different yeah. publisher. They'll be pleased that you mentioned that, too. <laughs> yeah, Walker and Company, that's the publisher. <laughs> robots and Empire is doubled it. Okay, so they're all happy. <laughs> Tell us about Halley's Comet. What's significant about it? Because uh, you... Well, go ahead. Well, the first, the first thing that's important about Halley's Comet is that it was the first comet to have its orbit worked out and its return predicted. That made an enormous splash in the 18th century because until then, nothing had been known about comets. They were very mysterious. People were scared of them. They were omens. They were omens of unusual things happening, and unusual things are always catastrophes. But once you can show they follow a fixed orbit and come back at predictable times, there's nothing mysterious about them anymore. And so that was the doorway into studying comets as a simple, ordinary astronomical phenomena. And then the other importance about them is that it's the largest and brightest of the short-term, uh, short-period comets. The only ones that are larger and brighter come in from way out there. And when was the last time that we saw it? 1910. 1910. Yes. It was a much better show then than this one is now because it, was, it passed Earth closer to it so that it looked larger and brighter. So this is a big deal? Uh, well, it's a big deal this year for our, for our astronomers because for the first time in history, they're going to be sending out probes to pass close by Halley's Comet and study it 
study it. The Soviets are doing a better job than we are of doing that, aren't they? Well, let's say human beings are sending out four probes. It doesn't matter the nationalities. There are two Soviets, one Japanese, one West European. Yeah. The West European, named Jato, will come closest. It'll pass within 500 miles. But whatever material they find out, whatever be shared, details... Saw, shared by the international scientific that's community. That's right. That's right. So that human beings are doing it. Uh, are you excited by it? Yeah, I have the feeling that it'll bear out, it'll bear out the current theory of uh, cometary structure, which was suggested by Fred Whipple back in 1950, that it's a dirty snowball. A dirty snowball. 85 to 90 percent just ordinary ice, but with all sorts of dust and gravel mixed in. Mm. And uh, undoubtedly that'll be it. But there's all sorts of interesting things we can find out about the minor components, yeah. the slightly different ices, and also how the tail forms, what uh, electromagnetic effects are present in the, in the tail, how it interacts with the solar wind particles from the sun, and so on. We're bound to find out yeah. all sorts of things. Now, do you have some theory about comets and the death of dinosaurs? Oh, well, this is my theory. I wish it were, because it's a very interesting one. Back in 1980, they discovered that there was a layer high in iridium at a certain point in the Earth, and it came just about at the time where the dinosaurs disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so they felt that perhaps an object from outer space, which is usually richer in iridium than Earth's crust is, had hit. What's iridium? Oh, it's a heavy metal, very much like platinum. Okay. There's very little iridium. It's not, I mean, the amount that's there isn't worth anything, but it's more than is in the layers just above or just below. And they figure there was a collision with some object from outer space, which perhaps cast up such a pall of dust and smoke uh, that it cut off sunlight for a period of time, killed most of the plant life, and therefore killed most of the animal life. And what about the stars, the star of Bethlehem? Well, some people think it might have been Halley's Comet, which showed up at 11 B.C. Do you believe that? No, I don't. It's because uh, there are so many other theories about it that there's no way of telling which one, if any, is right. It may have been entirely a, a pious fiction. We can't tell at this date. The only mention of the Star of Bethlehem is in a couple of verses of the Gospel of St. Matthew. That's all. There is no independent reference to the Star anywhere. Are you a religious man? No, I'm not. Why not? Uh, well, the easiest answer is I wasn't brought up so. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> but I mean, you are obviously a very curious man, and you have an open mind about everything. Oh, sure. And so you, what, you investigated religion and came to the conclusion that? Uh, no, I can't say I investigated religion with any particular interest, but I was interested in the Bible as a work of literature, mm -hmm. and uh, so I wrote a two-volume book on that but only as a work of literature, as, as one of the earliest, if not the earliest, serious histories we have. The Book of Kings, the Book of Chronicles, the Book of Samuel, uh, and also as a repository of great poetry, uh, probably the greatest poetry we have, certainly the greatest early poetry we have, and also as teachings of rather excellent ethical, uh, of, of, of ethical statements. Yeah. The one thing that the Bible isn't, that some people seem to think it is, it's not a biology textbook, it's not an astronomy textbook. The first, the first chapter of Genesis, the first couple of chapters of Genesis, are uh, the 6th century B.C. version of how the world might have started. We've improved on that since. I don't believe that those are God's words. Those are the words of men trying to make the most sense that they could out of, out of the information they had at the time. You don't buy Adam and Eve either. No, I don't buy Adam and Eve either. Uh, but uh, it's undoubtedly a legend which has some significance, but it's not historical. What about the life of Christ? Well, Jesus. Well, this, of course, is in historic times. It's at the time when the, when the uh, Roman Empire was at its height. And the thing about it is that all the only information we have about the life of, of Jesus is in the Gospels, in the New Testament Gospels. There's no reference to him in any literature outside. There's one dubious paragraph in the histories of Josephus, which may have Is that been... right? There's no reference to Jesus other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? 
and of course in, in, in the rest of the Bible, the, the, epistle, yeah, right. the epistles of Paul, Acts of the Apostles. Right, right, right. But outside the sacred writings, absolutely no mention. No historian who was not... Who, who, is, not, who, who is not a Christian, let's yeah. put it that way. Not in Bethlehem, no one left any writings of any kind. None, none. This doesn't mean that he didn't exist. The chances are he did. There were many people at the time who were, what should we say, messianic, mm -hmm. uh, who were believed to be messiahs by one group or another, and uh, Jesus survived in the, as a messiah. Incredible impact for someone who got such little notice at the time from historians, right? Well, that's true, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way sometimes it works out. Uh, when, when Mohammed also received little notice outside of Arabia, and uh, I dare say many founders of great religions were dismissed by people of the time, except those who believed in them. It's just one more kook. Interesting. And then back in a moment, Isaac Asimov, interesting man. We'll talk more about science fiction and the future science reality. Stay with us. Isaac Asimov is here. What scares you about the future? Nuclear war. Okay. Uh, overpop overpopulation. Really? Yeah. We've got now 4.8 billion people. Now, what's the problem with overpopulation? I mean, when you go to the length and breadth of this country, as I constantly do, you see nothing but open spaces. Yes, but the open spaces are devoted to feeding the people to... Uh, live in the urban areas. That's right. And, yeah, but we've uh, got more food than we need. We have. The We're not distributing well. Okay. The world doesn't. And don't forget, we had 2 billion people when I was born on Earth. It's 4.8 now. I'm not responsible, but that's the way it is. And, you have uh, no children? Oh, I have two, two children. Okay. That's just to replace me and my wife, you know. But uh, uh, in addition, if we consider that next time, next time Halley's Comet passes by, if we continue to increase at the present rate, well, I will have 10 billion people. So the next time it passes by, I would say 1910, it would be 75 years ago. 75 plus 85 is, what, 19, 8, 20, uh, 65, something like that. Yeah, something like that. And there'll be then, at the present rate of increase, 10, 11 billion people yeah. on What's it, China? One billion already? One yeah. billion already, but they're doing their level best they to sure keep it are. And, and to the displeasure of some people who have find real fault with their... Yes, but if they continue to increase in numbers the way they have been in the past, that would be to the displeasure okay. of a lot of people, too. Beyond that, what about the, 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 any ethical questions with robots? Any other, any other thing about the future that scares you? Uh, Not with robots. I consider that robots is liable to be a very good thing for us if they're used properly. Uh, but what about the possible abuse? Anything What could be, be abuse? the abuse? Well, they can be used to do human labor, and the humans who had been doing it before can be thrown out in the street and considered and not considered at all. And that could create a great deal of human misery. An absence of respect for human integrity, or for the dignity of woman or man. Well, if we, if we get to the point where we, dis, where we uh, have no respect for labor, if labor is only something robots do, and uh, then I think that might be bad. It still should be possible for human beings to work if they had yeah. what we usually would consider robotic labor. You know what I don't understand about you is how do you, how do you know so much because you spend all your time writing? Uh -huh. Well, I don't. I also read <laughs> in my spare time. In the interstices. In the interstices? I, as, and... Uh, in addition, I don't forget. I don't know how long that'll last. Do you, uh, you have a photographic memory? Oh, I wouldn't say photographic because yeah. I forget things like what my daughter looks like and so on. What your daughter looks like yeah, or when was, her birthday was. She once stood right next to me and I ignored her until after a while, as I studied her face carefully, I realized she was my daughter. But uh, uh, the things I need for my writing, yeah. I tend not to forget. Do you keep notes and cards and all that? No, all in my it's head. It's all up here. Yeah, which yeah. worries me because I am getting old now you, that I'm a little over 30. I, do you use a word processor? Yes, but I haven't thrown out my typewriter. Do you use computers at all? And just the just word the word processor. processor. Yeah, yeah. When you when you look at the people that have influenced you, who's had the most influence? Well, aside from my my okay, father of course, and mother. Your father, mother. Yeah, well, John Campbell. He was the editor of Astounding Science Fiction from 1938 to 1971. Astounding Science Fiction. Right, yeah. and I brought in my first story on June 17th, 1938. He'd only been the editor for a few months, and he took me in hand for some reason. And uh, in a sense, 
jollied me along, made sure I kept my nose stuck to the grindstone, encouraged me, discussed my stories yeah. with me, and, and to coin a phrase, made me what I am today. He did. Yes. Uh, I can Mainly be because he made you believe in yourself and made you... He saw something yeah. in me that maybe I might not have seen yeah. in myself. Quickly, writers born or made? Oh, I think born. You think born? Yes. Boy. Uh, a lot of people want to be writers, don't know whether they're, they've got it or not. And they, well, I dare say you can make a little, yeah. but uh, there's a limit to how much you can make. Isaac Asimov, you have certainly been, if nothing else, prolific and, and certainly popular, one of the best-known writers. I uh, want you to come back and we'll talk more. Pleasure to have you. Well, if I'm in Washington, I'll be glad to. Thank you. We'll continue. Stay with us.